Yeah, I do hope that that those upper level courses include formation flying. Because you can't consistently fly with somebody if you only use toggles. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't be there. So it forces you to use the whole parachute. And to me, that's a demonstration of real skill. If you can stay there, you know, within 100 feet of somebody for the entire high pull, you're you're a decent canopy pilot. That that or you just unstowed your toggles, let go, and the other person did all the work. But it's going to even that's not going to work because you're going to land off. <laughs> Right. So there's always the element of turn, you know, I mean, when I do briefings like on Sunday, right, I said, today, we're all flying together, you're going to partner up and we're getting we got different exercises that we're going to do. But you're not you're not going to be alone today. And it was nice. awesome. They Yeah, they made five jumps just, you know, doing different things. You got the guys with the 240s and you got the guys with the smaller canopies together. And I'm just bouncing around from group to group. And in some wow. case, I just would like one of them, I, like these two guys. And so I gave them my radios and I just flew with them. And so they're doing like working on circling around each other. And so I would just insert myself into the circle. So it have the th three of us circling around under canopy and then reverse it back the other way and circling around. That's fun. I mean, it works very well with a two way. You've seen it's, it's not hard to do. But when you do the three way, definitely a little more interesting. And it makes me wonder, you know, how big could we do uh, a rotating round, basically, of canopies? Are yeah. you doing the talking skydives for these? Or yeah. is it just? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's either I'm, I'm talking or the two way has my radios because I only have two. I used to have four, but they broke. Um, so, you know, I just like take it off of my helmet. I did that a few times this weekend. If I'm not on the load, my radios will be on the load. Um, uh, but yeah, I did, I did, uh, several talking skydives that went extremely well. Um, and it, it's, I just think that's one of the best <laughs> things. If we really want to make a difference in the sport, you need mentors that know how to do that. I mean, how do you define ready to do a, you know, in close formation flight it's a pretty fun coaching jump and you know with crew with crew coaching of course you're limited in the parachutes that you can use so it gets a little more complicated this is just you know whatever they're jumping if you could make a list of drills both for landing and in the air that should be done by the time you get your c or d license which, what would it be mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the the most important stuff is being able to turn in a coordinated manner to be able to to manage pitch in a variety of ways. Yeah, you, know, you would need to do, for instance, you know, deliberate pitch exercises where you, you know, hold the brakes, surge it, and then stop it before it goes through its natural cycle, and do adaptive braking so that you minimize those oscillations in a shorter time frame. Dive arrest turns is vital and i think it would be wise especially if you're talking about d licensed people dive arrest turns out of a front riser turn which is different mechanism you know you you've i mean the the ability to to just go from a toggle turn to bumping both toggles is one thing but if you're holding a front riser now you got to drop that front riser and hit the brakes or ease off of both of them as you're you know if you have a little bit more altitude so both of those i think would be really wise to do um I've found that most parachutes can cut their recovery arc in half uh, in a 180 degree turn by doing that. So that's a quantifiable thing. If you, I mean, I don't know that every drop zone is going to stick a fly site on their student to figure out if they, you know, cut their, their altitude loss in half. But um, I think that would be nice. I think a braked approach uh, demonstrated, you know, a, a competent braked approach into the target, not necessarily braking all the way to landing, but through the approach in a pattern that is not so big would be really, really wise. A braked approach where you're not so far from the target throughout your whole pattern. So like when you're landing off, you don't necessarily want to fly the world's <clears throat> largest pattern so by doing full flight on the downwind leg and then adding brakes as you go into your base leg in tight to the target, facing into the wind and the brakes, sinking it down so that you're not covering so much ground, lining it up and then easing it off at 100 feet and then flaring, 
um, I think it would be very good to, you know, for everybody to be able to demonstrate an off-field landing pattern. Some canopies, we had this discussion this weekend around the campfire, when you get so small that the parachute can't flare properly without a little extra airspeed, um, my feeling is this, either the, the pilot needs to be a real badass that's a good spotter or they are on too small a parachute. And he said, I believe that any canopy can be landed straight in. I said, I believe you're wrong, but you're welcome to try. And he proved himself wrong. <laughs> thankfully, he was in the so peas. Like, he was thankfully I mean, in the peas, but after he landed, the peas were all over the place and not where they used to be. <laughs> I mean, I do think we need to be able to <clears throat> walk and run on our parachutes. I mean, if you could design five jumps for the C license course and five jumps for the D license course, what would they be? Mm. To collect altitude loss data for a 90, 180, and maybe 270. I mean, I don't think the 270 would be important, but the 180, I, I do, I still hold that that's, that's valuable information because people that are not swoopers still do 180s into the ground for other reasons. They're not showing off for their girlfriend with the camera. They're, they're just barely making it back and feel like they need to turn it back into the wind. Right. And we've had numerous fatalities from that. So to know those numbers, um, to glean those numbers, I would certainly, I mean, I do that in my course, of course, I mean, even the people with 20 jumps, granted their parachutes about to change and those numbers are therefore going to change. But I think it'd be nice to get the C and D license holders to, to collect those numbers and not just the maximum amount of altitude your parachute's likely to lose in a 180, but also the minimums the different types of turns that, that reduce recovery arc. I think that those, those drills alone would be game changing if people did that. Okay. And, and they don't, <laughs> unless they come to the course, you know, other, other things like rear riser landing, you know, I had by the end of the course, most of the people this weekend had done a rear riser landing and none of them had done it before. You know, you give them exercises up high where they get to really learn not not just the flare, but also, you know, just slowing it down gradually to reach the stall point to know where it is. And then, you know, what you shouldn't go beyond in your landing. Um, but in all except one of them, um, they didn't stall on the landing. And, and the guy what happened to the one that stalled. He was nice and close to the ground and it was a non-issue because we had talked about pulling back on the rear risers to drive your upper body forward, to lift the knees and get the feet underneath your body. So even if it does pull back on you, at least you're resisting it by pushing forward with your chest. Um, I see. Yeah. And so he was fine. He still stood it up. It was really impressive to see people landing on the rears because you're going to need it sooner or later. You're going to break a steering line, toggle gets stuck, something not it up well not and the alternative thing. to that is to just cut away that's there's a whole philosophy about that is yeah to just chop I why mean, not you really want to do you want to ask the dealer for a whole new hand of cards or do you want to fly what you've got which is a perfectly good parachute if you've done the drills right i mean that's mm -hmm. it's all predicated on somebody having landed on the rear prior to the emergency situation that's why it needs to be on the on the list. Does that make sense? So then they don't have to cut yeah. away and then have a cutaway problem, right? Or have a I can't find my parachute problem. That's more likely. Right? They're not all in California go, oh look, there's the one pink thing in the middle of the big brown field. We got trees. <laughs> Cutaways back east are a big deal, or you know, up in Wisconsin or whatever. Um, so, you know, all, all that stuff, you know, we haven't had that many reserve failures. It's true. Um, but complications due to riding a reserve, which quite frankly is not quite as good a parachute. I mean, it's great for opening, but it doesn't flare quite as well in most cases. Um, it's just more complicated than just keeping what you've got, assuming that you've already done that exploration. So I, I still hold that that is, that's the way to go, you know? Or we could teach people to how to how to fly reserves better with double front landings, right? Well, that's also a good idea, right? I mean, it is. I mean, what if we, you know, made it a requirement to jump F one eleven 
seven cell canopies a little bit, you know, because everybody's got that in their reserve container. There's nothing else. Um, that, of course, requires a lot more F-111 canopies out there. You know, just like demo F-111 canopies, just call it. Well, you could do that with PD, 65 bucks, you get a you get a, a reserve right. mounted on risers. Yeah, yeah, but you have to wait to get it because they don't have huh. an, an infinite huh. number of them. Well, yeah, you know, a couple of weeks, they're not in that high of a demand. They're not, okay. Well, maybe they should be. Yeah, they should be. Yeah, but people don't always do what's good for them. No, they most maybe most maybe one requirement for CRD license is to demo reserve. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. If they haven't had a reserve ride, maybe right. But even in a reserve ride, how much did you get to know that reserve? You know, <laughs> you're getting right. down to twenty two hundred feet in your spinner. You cut away and now you're in the saddle by 1700 and, oh there's velcro toggles and oh there's trees avoid the power lines and you flare and you land and you go oh i survived that one you didn't really get to know the canopy right you know what i mean you didn't stall it you didn't see how much slack there is in the brakes you didn't front rise your your reserve at all right and you you don't know that that reserve likes front risers maybe the brakes are too short on your reserve i think that's a great idea to have to have a requirement to at the very least jumping jump something that's similar you know i mean for god's sake jump a, a wingsuit canopy i mean those are they flare about like a reserve <laughs> at least this way you're you've got something more similar than your saber a lightning breathing. yeah yeah put them on a lightning make them do a hop and pop yeah Something I would mention is uh, an intentional cross country, yeah. High pull cross country to learn yep. how far you can fly. I've had the opportunity Isn't to do several of those recently. Yeah. Isn't that part of the B license course, the long spot? It, well, they call it a long spot, but it's not defined. In some canopy courses, they only do from 5,000 feet. So I don't know if I'd call taking it out two miles across country. You know, and to me, a, a, a true cross country, you're open reasonably high and you're pretty far out. You picked a day that's windy. And you got to follow the roads, you know, you got to go IFR, I follow roads. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's really quite an amazing thing because you've got enough time on a cross country to observe where you're going and make some changes to your flight configuration and have, you have the time to see the differences. Um, I mean, I think you can do that from six or 7,000 feet, but I love that idea of, of a true cross yeah. country. Um, granted some places are, it's not so safe to do that you know beach drop zones or you know places in the mountains it, it gets a lot more complicated yeah uh, so we have to think about that one um, but you know you can have it as this is the rule but you can waiver that rule because you know drownable body of water or sketchy mountains or some other circumstances and you know the safety and training advisor can you know, make that not a requirement for you, but still taking it a few miles out is a great idea. Mind blowing how far a parachute can go, you know, if, yeah. you, if you do it right. Um, and you notice crab angle, right? I mean, I had, we had some long spots. The wind got a little bit strong this weekend. Brown winds, brown winds were like this. And the uppers were like that literally 90 degrees off and i didn't realize it until i got under canopy because i had neglected with a class of 11 or 12 or whatever it was um to just go to manifest and say hey exactly what are the winds i just trusted the pilot and that was my fault and it, it wasn't a problem everybody's landing on the drop zone but when i got under canopy the first time i turned it into what i thought was the wind line at 2500 feet and i'm going directly sideways so like oh, okay <laughs> Probably should have asked the right questions. Um, yeah, because often in a cross country, you've got to like crab this way, and now you're crabbing this way later. You just have to keep noticing where am I actually going to? Um, hey, Brian, yep. why, why, why isn't the turbulence drill with the stall to hands up and check the surge? Why isn't that a thing? Why am I the only one doing it? I don't know. Maybe I need to make a video or an article or something for Parachutist Magazine. Would you consider that in a, uh, like a good drill for CND? 
Oh, I think that's... No, because it takes a lot vital. of practice and it's scary. It's vi- it's a little bit scary. I mean, you don't have to go to the full stall, in my opinion. I think you just have to slow it down enough. But the surge is volatile, right? Because the, the surge ability of your parachute is basically inversely proportional to the airspeed. Do you teach it in your courses? I always make them do that in the courses. Yeah. So all the way hands up, not just like stop it here, you know, yeah. hands up and check, just, right? Just, yeah, just get those hands off real quick and then spank the brakes back down. Yeah. And not just once, but whatever is necessary to, to rebalance the system with opposing inputs. Yeah, we do that every every course. Right. Yeah. Nice. Call it I call it surge dampening. Surge dampening, okay. Yeah. Can you just Cliff notes that real quick. You just yep. full stall, hands oh. all the way up. You don't, there's no need to okay. do a full stall because with a full stall, you have a very deformed parachute and chaos. You know, if yeah, one, I mean, I do a full stall. stall you, well, you can, you well, can, but, but I think you get the lesson uh, a little bit more purely, if you will, if you simply slow down, lose the airspeed, airspeed down to maybe three quarter brakes or something. And you get off those brakes real quick and pounce on them as soon as it starts to dive, which is basically immediately, <laughs> you know. And as soon as you pounce on it and the canopy starts to return to center and you feel that motion, you know, in a positive pitch change, now you get off of those brakes. And the earlier you realize that this is occurring and start to respond, to it, the less it's going to oscillate back and forth in the process. Um, if, if you do it just right, you might need to just go basically off, on, off, one little touch one. That's it. That To me, that's like perfect. That's a well-executed maneuver. So um, actually, yeah, flight one and alter ego will do this too. But hmm? what you taught me was to go to full stall, which I thought was nice because it's a really hmm. quick surge. And yep. I was able to react so quickly. I don't even know why when, when those little tiny collapses were happening yeah. that I was preventing. Right. That you were actually preventing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it's just that not everybody can stall. And if they, you know, are going to to actually explore the stall of the canopy on the steering toggles, they got to take a wrap. And now you're adding an additional risk of if it doesn't go well and you got to cut away. Now you got stuff wrapped around your hands. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, keeping in mind that the the point of this is safety. <laughs> yeah, well, I take wraps during the stall. Yeah, the the um, medicine medicine should never be worse than the disease. I do take wraps during the stall, and then what I do is I check that I can, because there's a way to take a wrap where you kind of ties around the toggle thing sticking out the pin, yeah. and then there's a way to do it where you can just quickly unwind it. So um, yeah, yeah, there is there is a way, and it can be taught for sure. I mean, you know, wrapping it around your hand man altimeter is probably not the best way. <laughs> <laughs> putting your toggles on your feet and standing up probably not the right way <laughs> but entertaining <laughs> i was never actually stupid enough to do that um yeah yeah so that i think that's a great idea to to include at least some sort of surge dampening you know in in active pitch control right um I'm writing it down. And I would think by a D license, everybody should be able to stall on on rears or on toggles and recover. Yeah. Without losing well, their heading, without losing more than a hundred feet of altitude. You know, we, we got to put some specific parameters on it to 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 mark success, if that makes sense. You know, I reached a stall and I didn't die is too low a bar. <laughs> Hundred feet of altitude and sure. heading. Yeah, well, I mean, I just pulled that number out of my head, but the truth is, you could probably do it in a lot less than that. Like if you if you do it skillfully, um, I don't normally lose more than about forty or fifty feet in a toggle stall. In a rear riser stall, yeah, I guess it's probably pretty similar in altitude loss. Um, but that may vary with the canopy. So you don't want to, you know, if a canopy just doesn't like to recover real quickly after a stall, you don't want to penalize the person, you know, in the exercise. So you just have to take it in a case by case. But yeah, unfortunately, you might be forced to the use the word 
reasonable amount of altitude. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it is a little bit different from one of the next. Um, but that's a judgment. Yeah. So cross country, dive arrest turns, collecting altitude lost data, um, surge protection. <laughs> what about like front riser approach? So you don't have yeah. to land with the front risers, but at least use you, the front risers to lose some altitude below a certain that, amount of feet. That I think I, you know, as a safety and training advisor could get behind that. Right. But there, there's a lot of folks that are you know, safe skydivers out there that I really, I don't think I would trust them to do front risers all the way down to flare altitude. But what you're talking about there has a lot of benefits. If you're, you know, coming, uh, if you're set up a little bit too high, you could fix the problem. And as I talk about a lot in the courses, you know, you, how you get off of those front risers is just as important as the choice to do it. You know, you get off real slowly so that it doesn't surge into level flight. Surge, sorry, wrong word. <laughs> Balloon, maybe in the old days, that's what we used to call it ballooning. Um, maybe there's a better term. So it so it doesn't level off and shoot off. Um, what other great drills? Um, I I would certainly like to see people be able to fly a coordinated turn. And how would you measure that? Rib line compared to bridle angle. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, the rib line angle. compared to bridle angle. That's a pretty good, that's definitive. It needs to be discussed a lot more. I mean, I've written articles, I've made videos, and I hope that they show up, but you can't make them drink. At least not information. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, to, to, to demonstrate coordinated turns, not on a front riser, because that's cheating. That's always coordinated, but demonstrating proper harness turn technique and or proper toggle turning technique, right? Because I remind people, once I tell the whole story of, well, this is rudder pedal, this is aileron, it all makes sense. They're like, well, I only use my harness now. I was like, well, actually. Yeah, what is proper harness turn technique? Effective. So harness turns and what else was it that you said? Well, I mean, well, in, in, a, in, a, in a toggle turn that is... Uh, not aggressive at the start of it no. plus Excuse gradual right? yeah gradual, sort of gradual at the beginning and then increasing roll angle gradually and, and then gradually coming out of it right to me that's that's just as coordinated um you know that i mean the bottom line is you watch that pilot shoot and you feel that load factor not shifting to one side you know where you're loading one side of your canopy um what about like flare turns and turn flares yeah. for landing? Would you trust, would you want well, people that have a D license to be able to, to have actually done some of those? Oh, uh, well, I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with making them do a downwinder, but I do think that it would be wise for them to, uh, at the very least be required to do a crosswind landing, which can be done where you flare and then curve. And it can be done where you curve and then flare, right? Um, and I, I do with more advanced students, I set them up like that. And, and um, this weekend we did one, uh, two, two loads where I said, no, this, you know, the, here's the wind line. I want this pattern that ends up 45 degrees to the wind line. And for those of you that feel comfortable with you know, at, you know, maybe 50 or 75 feet leaning in the harness, getting that turn towards the wind line begun, and then adding those brakes slightly higher than the normal flare altitude and blending the process. And the one where you level off completely, you know, zero roll angle crosswind, and then you lean on the harness and add your gentle toggle in the offset position and ride it through that one. And those are uh, absolutely drills that a CNDD license holder should be able to do. You know, you're, you're giving them a, a situation where they're getting a positive reinforcement result if they're turning into the wind. Like why shouldn't every D license person be able to do all that stuff? I, I completely agree. Yeah. And it's- Well, funny. no, cause you were saying, it's you funny. were saying 
that there's people you wouldn't trust to do that to do the front riser all the way to the ground um i'm thinking more of like older jumpers and think you know folks that maybe don't have the strength to pull on their fronts very effectively you don't want to oh, right if, if they've got some other reason why they aren't physically capable they can be a sca- safe skydiver without being able to pull their fronts they can uh, got they're it. a little bit limited you know there's solutions that they're going to have to come up with that that accomplish the same goal like rolling in a sachet to accomplish that same goal um but they can survive the sport but they they're not going to survive if they don't know how to bail out of a low turn they're not going to survive if they don't know how to crab it into the wind during the flare Uh, and so would you say that being able to flare from a turn should be added to the list yes or is that just too dangerous like well, it, it doesn't can be have... a 15 degree turn, right? Or, it, or... It, can, it can be from the base leg to the final. Why does it have to be at landing? Right. That's something that's filmable. You know, I mean, it's a little harder to quantify their altitude loss, but at least you can see that they rolled into the turn and bumped the brakes. They're going to be, they're going to be deep because they're going to overshoot now. <laughs> you know, I mean, if they flew a perfect pattern and they do that kind of a turn, they're going to end up high after that turn and potentially overshoot but that's something that you can tell them you know have your base leg a little deeper than you normally would um and i think likewise uh possibly even more important than your suggestion about adding front risers on final to shorten you would be to add rear risers on final to lengthen the the final approach leg I think that would that that really could help a lot of people. I understand you know, people overshooting. What's going on with my camera? <laughs> it's getting all funny. Um, people do overshoot into the trees. Absolutely. They hit fences. They smack into hangars. They hit airplanes and helicopters. But um, undershooting is equally problematic, especially if you don't make it over that fence. So getting onto rears, the appropriate amount getting small and getting off of those rears at an adequate altitude. That is something I would definitely like to see. And that's something that I I feel like everybody should be able to do that. Fronts are heavier than rears. Usually they let it off and hit the brakes and it doesn't do anything. They break their legs. Um, Again, the medicine is worse than, than the disease. Uh, So it, it would make sense to me to have a very specific, you know, objective, like, well, for instance, now we've got audibles that can, you know, beep at a hundred feet, you know, that's, I mean, most canopies, you can be in half, even three quarter breaks at a hundred feet and come off of it. And it's going to recover by then, but it will be oscillating. Um, And of course, the more lifty the canopy is, the shorter the recovery arc, the more uh, sort of exaggerated those oscillations tend to be. So you're kind of penalizing the people with big parachutes, but hey, you know, um, yeah, that's not a bad idea at all. Uh, but I, I think, mean, yeah, I, I, I think I, at the beginning, we have to ask the question, where are the problem areas? You know, yeah. before we going into the, the, the gigantic, you know, galaxy of possibility of what we could make people do to make them sort of better in general. Where are the problem areas? Where are people getting hurt? They are tipping over on windy days. They are flaring too low and they're flaring too high and letting off of their brakes. They're turning too low. <clears throat> Those are That's pretty much it. That's four things. And so if we design drills based on the actual data, you know, the injury, the you know, mechanism of injury, um, then we're going to create a, a reasonable plan. 